Okay, I, I, I wanted to talk about this. I might sound sick. I just got allergies, pollen, you know, I was out all day, but... Atheists, what could change your mind? Proof that cannot be fabricated. The Bible is meant to be the word of God, but it was written down. Okay, okay. Let's really break this down because I, I, I don't know. I just feel compelled to. Proof that cannot be fabricated. And then he goes into the Bible. Um, okay. That's an interesting tangent that... I mean, it's like low-hanging fruit, but it's an interesting tangent. Proof that cannot be fabricated. And then you can go into proofs that people have and show how they can be fabricated. But let's just change subjects here and just go straight to the Bible. To be the word of God, but it was written down by humans. Okay. Here's where the, here's where the issue lies. The Bible is meant to be the word of God. First of all, it depends on what you mean by word and what you mean by God. It, it, it's actually a, it's a personal thing because if you look at it, a religion is not necessarily like a separate entity from other things. Like there's no real line separating a religion from a story or a belief or anything like that. The only difference is People just choose to call it religions because they can kind of compartmentalize based on the way that the emergent properties of the group people that all believe it interact with other people. And they say that, oh, I'm this religion, you know, the way that people can be kind of, they can kind of apply labels to themselves and, and simplify their own personalities down into these like, oh, I'm this religion. So that should, you know, give you some information on what you need to know about me rather than like explaining people's beliefs. But a religion can be literally anything. Like if you believe something religiously, like if I'm, if I go to the gym religiously, you know, if I, if I don't compromise it for anything else, it, you use the word religiously and it's not something that, uh, it, it kind of applies with like the same logic. In fact, there is like a, there is a really, really strong, like cultish behavior with going to the gym now with all these like ziz people with like the gym culture people, gym bros. There is like a real, like, uh, basically a religion that's formed off of it now. Um, or at least like a very, very strong fan base. But it was written down by humans. The Bible cannot be trusted simply because it may have all been made up from the beginning. Yeah, and it was. But that's the thing. In terms of, in terms of words that have value, okay? I'm going to go real right down to the bare bones, okay? All the words that you read or hear or whatever, in terms of words that have value, the highest value words are fictional stories. And I'm, I'll say that, and you know what? On a, on a different day, I can I can back it up. In fact, I have backed it up with like three different SOCs and I'll leave them linked. No, I won't even leave them. I'm tired of leaving these links in the description, bro. I've been doing this for every single fucking video. If I feel like it, I'll leave it in the description. But, um, and I might add this to the like lessons of storytelling as well, maybe if I actually go into that. But think about it like this. Let's take a story, for example, okay? A religion is really just a story. People look at these religious books like the Bible and everything as like different from other books. Like, oh yeah, uh, you know, Animal Farm is not the same thing as the Bible. Animal Farm is a, just a fictional story. The Bible is a religious book. No, they're both just fictional stories. And they're both also religious books. There isn't actually much of a difference, really. Um, if it resonates with people, then it's religious. And the only difference separating religious books from non-religious books are how deeply it resonates with people. And that's really where the value comes from. It's understanding not necessarily taking the story for what it is at face value, but understanding this is what resonated with people. So this can teach me a lot about people. This can teach me a lot about the way the world is and the way the world was and, and who we are and where we came from. <clears throat> people who are unable to see the value in that just come across as really, really unintelligent. I don't know why. I mean, I was, I, I came, I was always the kind of person that would be like, yo, there's no value in this kind of thing. It was written by humans. If something is written by humans, does that mean that it's not able to be trusted? Because I, I've made this previous stream, okay? 
And I'm going to constantly link back to this, actually, because this is like part of the foundations of my beliefs. Everything that you everything that is important for you to know, or rather everything that you ever can know is already in your own head. If someone gives you a piece of advice, you know, and you're like, man, I really learned a lot from that piece of advice. No, you didn't. You already knew everything. Because it wouldn't have worked, it wouldn't have resonated with you, you wouldn't be able to say you learned a lot from that piece of advice if you didn't already know it was true. If someone says, you want to know how you can, you know, really, uh, you know, fix up your life, go out into the street and take a shit on the street. You'd be like, no, that's obviously not right. You're not even going to try it. But if someone says some great piece of advice, like some great quote or whatever, like, um... Man suffers because he takes seriously that which God made for fun, you know? And you can replace the word God with nature every single time in every single religious text, um, and it all works out perfectly. But if, if people hear that quote, they go like, oh man, that's so true. I, uh, people take this stuff so seriously, and, and that's why they suffer. It's just it's something that you have for fun, something that you do for fun. And... Um, the only reason why people are able to even say that it's right is because they already have a cross-reference set of information in their head that's innate to them that they can... Where's the cap to my water bottle? Okay, yeah, that they can look back on and be like, yo, yeah, this is this is correct. This is a good quote, and this is something... This is a valuable quote. But it's only valuable because you already know it's valuable. All the information you need to know about the world is literally already in your own head. You just don't dig deep enough usually. None of us do. <clears throat> not that we ever really can, or maybe we shouldn't even dig deep enough. It, it's, it's up in the air, you know, but I'll leave that stream in the description. If you don't like really watch that whole stream, cause I go more in depth and then come back to this. Let's take a story, for example, like the dark Knight, right? When, when the Joker was like, Hey, uh, this person who screwed you guys over with, um, like, I don't know, he was, it was some like bank thing or whatever. He's like, this person, um, <clears throat> if you guys don't kill him every single hour, I'm going to kill people or whatever, or I'll blow up a hospital or something like that. No, he said he was going to blow up a hospital anyways. No, he said, I'll, I'll, people will die if you guys don't kill this one person that none of you guys like. Um, and then all the people went out and like normal civilians went out with guns and they tried to go kill him and you think about it for a second, you're like, man, that's so true. That totally would happen, right? Because we all know, we all understand human behavior somewhat. In our own minds, we have a vision of what human behavior is, right? And so, but it's a fictional story. It's not real. It never happened. How can you possibly go like, oh, that's so real or that's not real? Why do people complain when fictional stories are not realistic, when they show characters that do stupid things? It's a fictional story, right? No, it has to make sense. It has to be able to, you have to be able to cross-reference it with the with your understanding of character that you already have innate to your own mind. And you have to be able to go like, hmm, if a person was in this situation, would they actually do this? And if they wouldn't do it, then it doesn't make sense. Then the fictional story is not a good story. Then people like, Everyone's like, oh, yeah, the new season of Rick and Morty, they're like so out of character, it doesn't even make any sense for them. How would they be out of character if their characters are made up? Th that's the thing. Their characters are not made up. They're characters. If a human being writes something, if a human being is truly artistic and they write something from, from like their deepest part of their being, they're not getting it arbitrarily. They're not writing something fictional. They're writing a myth. They're writing something that is core to this innate cross-referenceable potentially to, for some people more than others and you know maybe you need psychedelics for it but or maybe just meditation would do it but they're getting this information from this ether they're tapping into this ether basically um if you want to describe it as that well, there's no real like words for this kind of thing that's why it's so tricky but they're tapping into this and they're telling stories about how human beings act and that way you can look at these stories and you can, by cross-referencing, you end up learning yourself. You end up confirming. It's all confirmation. You end up learning yourself. Okay, yeah, this is how human beings act. 
And so you could tell a lot about a person by the kind of stories they resonate with. And so you look at the stories of the Bible, right? And then you look at the kind of people that resonate with it and the kind of people that don't resonate with it. And then you were able to tell, okay, people who resonate with these stories view humans in this way. They view human, realistic human behavior in this way. When I look at the stories people say about Donald Trump or whatever, like, oh, he did this and this and this, that none of that makes sense to me. Because I'm like, there's no way a human being is actually acting this way. Because I'm a human being too. And there's no way I would do that. So it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, these are definitely lies. That's just what I feel like. Um, and a lot of times I'm, it's proven that I'm, I was correct. And they were just straight up lies by Donald Trump. And, uh, other times, well, nothing really ever gets proven one way or another, but yeah, it's, it's like, a people who hear those stories who go like, yeah, uh, Donald Trump totally did this terrible thing, right? And somebody tells them that and they go, oh yeah, I totally believe it. I'm going to believe it and I'm going to tell it at the dinner table to my family tomorrow night and uh, I'm going to complain and I'm going to add even more things onto it and make him look even worse. They're deluding themselves by adding more things on. If you ever catch yourself, by the way, it's a good way to catch yourself if uh, literally being brainwashed. If you're telling a story about how bad someone is or how bad some group of people is or, oh, Israel is doing this to pass, whatever, right? If you catch yourself doing something like this and while you're telling someone the story, you add something on top of it, like, oh yeah, and they also, they, they did this as well. Like someone was telling me about how many school shootings there were. Um, and there was like in January, there were 18 school shootings. There were not 18 school shootings. There was actually not. Um, there was actually zero school shootings. Um, and if you wanted to... If you wanted to describe like, okay, a student having a gun on premises shooting the gun, then there was like one school shooting, but he wasn't even on inside the school or whatever. And the rest of the 17 were people like cops or whatever, uh, like chasing criminals and the criminal happened to pull into a school and got, get shot or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. Like those were all the things and they labeled them all as school. Not only that, they labeled them as mass shootings. Even if only one person died, they labeled them as mass shootings. Um, and so this person, knowing this information, went out of his way to make it look worse than it actually was because you have to rely on lies for that kind of thing. So he went out of his way to be like, yeah, no, there was 18 school shootings in January. As if one is not bad enough. And that's the thing. One isn't bad enough, actually, in his own mind. And he can confirm that himself. Simp he's proof of that simply by the fact that he was trying to lie about it and make it seem worse. If it is bad enough, then that's all you need. So if you ever catch yourself doing that kind of thing, that's how you know you're being deluded. That's how you know you're brainwashing yourself. That's how you know you're being fooled. And then you can look at whoever perpetuated that idea to you and be like, yeah, here's the perpetrator. This is the person that's fooling me. But... Um, what's it called? When some people hear stories about like, oh, Donald Trump did this terrible thing or whatever or whatever, and they believe it, I look at them and I'm like, yeah, this is not a good person I want to be around. Because to them, it's probably realistic. To them, like, you hear, uh, they hear a story about like, oh, yeah, this capitalist pig did this thing and he screwed these people over. And it makes so much sense to me why they would do this. I'm like, wow, if you were in that same position, would you do it? Like, you're a human being just like them. And then I find that that's almost always true. It's projection. It's literally projection. It's projection not necessarily on what someone is doing, which is usually what people assume is projection. It's projection on what a person would do in that same situation. People often complain about like, oh, the, like that one chick, that uh, Nico little chick with like, had that Bernie shirt on, you know, the whole like tax the rich, eat the rich, whatever, right? Then she became rich. She bought like a $2 million penthouse. She did all this stuff and she was doing the same things that the people she was criticizing was doing. She was criticizing those people because she could understand how she in that same position would be doing the same thing. I don't care. I don't criticize Donald Trump because to me, it doesn't make any sense. Because if I was in the same position, I wouldn't be doing all those things, whether or not those things are even true or not, you know? So, so to me, it, 
I, I try my best to not project. And I, I found myself doing this when I was younger, when I was like 16 and all stuff. I found myself doing all this stuff where I'd criticize people and all that. Uh, people who I've never met in my life, who I, I never even had any sort of confirmation of, of their existence, whether or not they were even real. And this is the thing. If you look at it with religions, right? These are all religions at the end of the day, actually, if you really dig deep. When somebody doesn't resonate with a story, when they go like, this story doesn't make sense, it's not realistic, it doesn't fit real life, you can tell a lot about the kind of person they are. Especially when that story is is trying to teach something that, from another perspective, you can tell is a good thing to teach. And it could have been altered completely during its... Yeah, it ha it absolutely has been. That's what happens to stories. It's 2000. But the merit from the story simply comes from the proof in it. The proof in the pudding is simply the fact that it worked. It's simply the fact that over these 2000 years, so many people believe it. That's not trivial. That's not nothing. You may not be able to read the story and be like, let me take the story literally and take everything it says as legit and factual and that this is proof. And that this is the proof that God exists. No, you don't take it like that. You take it as this is a story. It's an interesting story. It's got a lot of weird information in here, a lot of scientifically inaccurate information, but a lot of a lot of stories kind of dense, kind of compacted into one long book um, that has had alterations, but and do translations and things like that. But what's weird is how many people resonate with it. What's weird is there's like a billion and a half people in the world that look at the story as if it's 100% like this is the word of God. And that's where you get the value from. You look at that and you go like, what can I learn about people by trying to analyze why this resonates with so many people? And that is really where the value in religion comes from. It teaches you about people, not about what's in the Bible. The people who, who look at the Bible as like uh, the fact, a fact of life, like they look at everything at, in, in like from like surface level and they go, this is absolutely true. You have to do all these things. Um, those people are stupid. You could just ignore them. But and not ignore them. Nothing's trivial. But you can learn a lot about people by looking at why the, it ended up the way that it did. Years of existence. If someone wanted to change the... And, and it's like if someone wanted to change, yeah. But someone could go like, man... That movie, The Dark Knight, that's so true that that would happen, you know? Like if somebody did, um, you know, basically put a bounty on someone that nobody liked, that screwed everyone over, uh, and said that people will die if people don't kill this person, they totally would go barbaric and all oh, go kill that person. I'd go like, uh, actually, that's not true. It was written by a human, you know? And it, it was probably altered throughout the course of its writing, you know? He probably conceptualized the idea and then he probably altered it throughout the, you know, couple of years that he was writing it down, you know? So it can't be trusted. You'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's how you look at stories. That's how you look at religions. They're stories. Bible 1,400 years ago, we'd be none the wiser. Not to mention... No, no, no. You, you go in, you go in kind of with your perspective on life, going like, yeah, they probably did alter it. So you, you imagine this is the story. This is the combined story of 2,000 years of original writing and alterations and you know what throw in plagiarism too while you're at it throw in everything and you look at this insanely complex writing that isn't just something simple as like this is the word of god that's too easy that's for simple-minded people to look at it that way no you look at it as all these things combined and you go like okay wait this is everything this is the quintessential story this is the story of humanity like this is what human beings resonate with this is something that you can learn a lot from and the fact that meaning can be lost and misinterpreted when translating into exactly and that's also something you've taken into account if you ever watched evangelion you know that like communication without misinterpretation is worthless like communication has to have misinterpretation that's what makes us human being if there's communication at 100 percent bit rate and there's no data loss that makes you a machine that makes you a robot that makes everybody agree on everything that makes it so that like if you can connect your brain to another person's brain to make it so that every single thought that you have can be justified in your own mind and you can justify it to them without the need for words or explaining it to them and they would truly, truly understand where you're coming from, there would be no reason to have any conversation with anyone. There would be no reason to be a human being. Different languages. The only way I'm changing my mind is if I physically see a god do something that no human can do. 
No human can do. Well, humans can't do a lot of things. Water into wine won't work on me. Sleight of hand magicians are insanely talented. I'm gonna need an elephant to appear out of thin air, Mao. That's the thing. And he ends it with Lamau. That's cope. This is the part that I, I really wanted to talk about right here. I'm gonna need to see an elephant pop out of thin air. You see, the reason why fictional stories... Oh man, I can't believe I'm tying it back to this actually. I didn't even think I would. But the reason why fictional stories are the peak of truth and writing is because it's it's sort of like... It's sort of, it's role play, it's acting. It's acting, um, actually that, that's really all it is. If something is a, is a non-fiction story, it's less of an act. If something is a fictional story, especially taking place in a totally different fantasy world that never existed, animated, whatever, we can still believe it. Human beings, you, you, you look at animation, you look at kids watching these animations and things like that, and you realize Suspension of disbelief, the way that kids experience it, it's simply, it's a, it's a life arc. St listening to stories is the arc of life. Reading, listening to, watching, and telling stories is the arc of human existence. It is the human condition. It is stories. Because he said, an elephant out of thin air, right? Well, guess what? If you were born your whole life and you saw elephants appearing out of thin air, you wouldn't think it was so weird. And you know what you would need after that? You would be like, you would be like, yeah, an elephant out of thin air is not going to work for me. So think about it like this. Let's say someone says, I'm going to need an elephant to appear out of thin air in order to prove God's, God's existence. And God says, okay, yeah, sure, fine, I'll do it. From that point onward, everyone would be like, okay, elephant out of thin air, totally normal. And everybody who was born after that would view it as like, this is just the world. Like you look at kids, it, we're not trained to look at the world for what it is. We're trained to live in, in any world really and try to piece together how the world actually works. Our brains are not equipped with knowledge about how an elephant looks. But our brains are equipped with the knowledge to try to understand and learn the forms that create an that create all kinds of animals. And if it just so happens to be an elephant that we see, then we start to understand that. And that's why, you know, you can animate completely made up animals and people will understand that they're animals. You can animate completely made up parasites or completely made up robots or completely made up planets or weather systems or whatever or, or anything like that. And people will be like, yeah, this is... This is totally, and everyone will agree on it because we understand forms. Um, and this is Plato's thing, but, <clears throat> and it's also the idea of opposites, but that, that's a bit deeper. That's a bit deeper, but um, he's like, I'm going to need to, I'm going to need to have an elephant up here at thinner. So he's basically requesting that throughout his lifetime, the, the, the standard for what is real needs to change because like you understand what I'm saying, right? You understand what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, no, now I need, I need whatever I believed when I was young, whatever, uh, world I lived in when I was young, I'm gonna need to be transported to another world when I'm older, rather than I'm gonna need to be transported to a world where none of these things are possible. But did it ever occur to you that when you were little, your worldview was being shaped and your understanding on what was normal and what was possible was literally all completely malleable and being written right there like if elephants started to appear out of thin air when you were a baby you wouldn't think it was weird when you're older so from a universal scale from a grand perspective you look at the world for what it is not for how dramatically it can change in your lifetime by doing something supernatural supernatural literally cannot exist because if something is observable then it is natural if 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 you know, God were to create a gust of wind coming at you out of nowhere, then that's not supernatural anymore. It's physical. It's part of the physical world. Um, and this is basically how you crush dualism. And it's also how you can crush a lot of religious idiots. But there's no point in doing that. They're idiots. Don't deal with them, you know. Don't, don't 
spend time around people so much stupider than you. But <clears throat> it's like arguing with someone is kind of is is kind of an admittance that they can pose a challenge to you and that not only are they worth teaching, but they have something to offer you as well if they win the arguments. So to argue with religious people about how wrong they are shows how stupid you are. Um, if you call these people stupid, that is. But um, what was I saying? Yeah, I'm going to need something that, that happened, like some, some miraculous thing to happen now. I'm going to need to see some miracle. Basically, I'm going to need to see something that defies everything I know up until this point. Bro, that happens to a lot of people, first of all. That happened to me. Uh, second of all, who's to say that this kind of thing hasn't happened like a million times in the past? And we just look at the world for what miracles it actually is and examine the world for what it is. Because you don't have any imagination if you think that the world is what it is and it, it always has been and forever will be this kind of thing. Especially considering the fact that like our brains are not wired to look at the world and be like, this is true, this is not true. Our brains are wired to look at the world and take everything in like a sponge. That's why you can convince kids that Santa Claus is real. Because if kids were, you know, rational and they, they understood, oh, yeah, miracles and whatever. Yeah, I'm going to need to see some miracle. They wouldn't go like, actually, they would go like, actually, that doesn't make any sense. Santa can't exist. That, that's, that's weird. That's got to be, you know, that's some godlike thing. That's, that's a godlike ability. And that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to need to see proof of that. No kid says that. I mean, when they're older, they might say that. But that's because they developed a worldview. When you don't have a worldview, everything works. You can take a kid, put them in a dark room, have them watch only animated, 2D animated content their entire lives. And then when they're like five years old, you put them out into the world, in the 3D world, and they'd be screwed. They wouldn't know what the hell to do. They wouldn't, they'd be like, this looks like a fantasy world. This is a miracle. This is like God doing this right now. That's what they think. Because the 2D world is a world that they know. And so... You look at the world and you go like, let's pretend that this has already happened and that God is not going to uh, appeal to me particularly and my particular sentiments and strike down lightning when I tell him to strike down lightning. Let's just replace the word God with nature and just look at the miracle. Look at, are there miracles in general? Yeah, bro, there's elephants. Like, are you kidding me? You can show an elephant to someone who's never seen elephants before and we'd all have the same agreement on it. We'd all be like, oh shit, that's crazy. Big elephants are scary. Yo, look at the elephants that have uh, these tusks. Oh, look at look at the baby little elephants that, you know, move their trunk around for the first few years of their life and they just like kind of flop it around. Look at this, look at this. Um, uh, I'll just open up a new baby elephant trunk, trunk swing. Look at the way that they, look at the way they move their trunk. So when you're older, you kind of know what to do with their trunk. You kind of use it as like an appendage to, uh, like kind of like a hand basically to manipulate your environment, to grab things, to grab food, all that sort of thing. Right. Um, but you know, when you're a baby, baby elephants don't really have the strength to do any of that stuff. So they kind of don't know what they're doing with it. And so they kind of just flop around there. Look at this. This is the baby elephant. It just. They just flop it around and that's kind of what they do. The same way like a baby human being will, and this is the thing, this is why we love elephants so much because they remind us of human beings. This is why no one likes bugs, even though they're both the same level of life form, they're, they're both just as alive. No one cares about like, you know, oh, why would you kill this bug? But if you kill an elephant, bro, you're going to jail. That's because we can anthropomorphize elephants more. That's literally what it is. It's Nietzsche's philosophy uh morality is aesthetic you look at the aesthetics of reality that's what people base their morality off of it's wrong to kill a, a butterfly but it's okay to kill a moth like that sort of thing even though they're literally the same thing one just looks pretty and that's really what it is human beings value beauty it's so cute it's it's so cute to see because it's like wow our babies are not so different from their babies. And if we were in this anthropomorphized, you know, system here, and we were looking, we'd be like, oh, that's so cute. So they kind of just move it around for the first couple years of their life. 
because <clears throat> they don't really know what they're doing with it. <clears throat> and then eventually they, they kind of figure it out. It's the same sort of thing. Our brains are very similar. They got big brains too. Um, and they're not similar in the way that like, you know what I'm talking about. All animals' brains are relatively similar. When you're when you're a baby, it, your brain is very overconnected. It's very overstimulated. So, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, so if you think about an apple when you're like one year old, uh, your leg might spasm and your arm might shoot out to the side and you might say some like incoherent baby thing and you might blink three times and, you know, you like it's a bunch of different things, right? Because one signal, it's we're much more organized. Our brains are much more organized, and they're much less connected when we're older. Um, as we get older, up until about twenty-five years old, then they then they uh, plateau. But <clears throat> that's why, like, if you send a signal, I want to move my arm. I want to move my right arm. It's going to send that one signal. It's not going to interfere with any other signals, and you're only going to move your right arm. And you might think about it as well. You might say it out loud. Uh, you know. People who have Tourette's might do something else because there's different uh, connections being made. But when you're a baby, because everything's so overconnected, there's so much overlap between neurons. If you think about moving your right arm, you might also move your left arm along with it. So, and I'll, actually, they're, they're very similar. They're very the neural pathways to moving both arms are very close to each other. So it's it's easy. It's a lot easier to um, do things with both hands at the same time. Than it is to do things with one hand and then another hand with the same amount of effort going to each hand. That's why you can, um, you know, like if you were to draw out a circle with your fingers and you were to go like opposites, right? Like let's say you move your, you, you move your, uh, you draw a circle with your right arm and you move it clockwise. It's very easy to do the same thing with your left arm and move it clockwise as well because you're kind of sending the same signals just at the same time. But it's actually even easier to move your left arm counterclockwise. It might be a bit difficult after you moved it clockwise because um, you just fired off a different signal. And so it's, it's uh, you're kind of overloading your signals, by the way. If you don't, if you don't do this frequently, you're, you're giving it a bit, of, give a bit of pressure. But like if you try to design like a shape, like you draw a shape on a piece of paper, you take two pencils, you can basically make a mirror image of, of each other simply by imagining what you would do with one hand and drawing a shape with one hand, not even paying attention to the other hand, but you basically send a signal to your brain saying, whatever I do with my right hand, I'm gonna mirror with my left hand. And it's, it's shocking and you'll be like, whoa, I'm on autopilot. I'm literally able to move my arm and it's able to do these complex things on autopilot simply by focusing on just one arm. Um, but that's basically why this happens. I, 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 there's no reason to go in depth on that, but that's basically why this happens. There's much more organization in the connections of the neurons. And so neurons are further apart, larger brain, less scrambled, you could say, right? Um, it's a less scrambled brain. So when you send a signal, it's sending the signal. When this baby sends a signal, he's also flapping its ears and he's moving his legs and he's, you know, moving his tail and all this stuff. And so, yeah. But they, they kind of just move it around a lot and it's really cute. And I look at that and I'm like, damn, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. If the fact that I said that and people can resonate with that and they'd be like, oh, that's so cute. How the hell can I predict that everybody else will think that that's cute? That's kind of a miracle in itself. And that's, that's what I take from religion. I don't, every time I say God, you can replace it with the word nature and and you can basically assume what I'm saying, okay? Because that's what I view God as at this point. Um, not necessarily, but it's interchangeable for me. And you can look at old religious texts and you can be like, you can look at it as God is, is unforgiving, cruel, and ruthless, but at the same time, generous and beneficent and merciful and everything all at once and you can run away from God or you can embrace God or you can destroy God or like what Nietzsche said God is dead and we have killed him like you look at the arc of life right throughout all of human history the arc of life was this well there's several arcs of like life 
but a major one was man versus nature. Hold up, I need some more. My nose is super runny. You look at it like um, man versus nature, right? That's probably the oldest story, probably. Um, and you can look at other human beings as well in, in a, as a part of nature as well if you wanted to. Um, because the place that the story comes from is other animals also do resonate with that story. You put a boxing heavy bag in the forest and animals will come and hit it and they'll play around with it. They play games just like how humans do. Um, so these stories, I mean, if they can understand English, it would resonate with them as well to a certain extent. The simpler ones at least. Um, but like the story of the mother and the father and the hero and all these things, you could see these stories emerge in the way that much simpler animals behave, you know? Um, they're a lot like humans in that way. We're just animals at the end of the day. That's all we are. We're just like the rest of them. <clears throat> and throughout all of, well, really all of, you know, organism history, like life, like life on planet Earth for like three billion years, three and a half billion years or so, maybe four, <clears throat> depends, right? The story has always been, the, the prevailing story, the story that, that determines whether or not you get to pass on your genes <clears throat> has always been man versus nature, or I guess if you want to go that far back, organism versus nature, or creature versus nature, right? And you can imagine it like a boxing fight. This is how I like to imagine it, like an MMA fight or whatever. And the meaning in life doesn't come from being absolutely destroyed by nature, okay? As a lot of people might go down that extreme and they might go, you know what, I want to go live in the forest and abandon all uh, my b belongings and material possessions and all this stuff. And, you know, I, I want nature to take me and, and m turn me back into an animal. That's not where the meaning in life comes from. Because if you look at it from that analogy, all that is is the nature, the person that's representing nature is just beating you down. It has you in in a, in a choke and it's just it's just killing you and you refuse to tap until you die. And that's no way to fight. And there's nothing fun about fighting if all you're doing is getting hit and you're never able to hit the other guy. However, it's also no fun if you just crush the other opponent. If you knock them out with one punch and then you're on the ground, ground and pound, just beating them up repeatedly. And that, look, at that's what we're doing. That's why some people are so miserable. That's why the people who... who People have an in, people have a have a inclination in their lives to lean more towards giving nature the upper hand versus giving humans the upper hand, and human beings have survived all this time because of the balance that's been struck, because the species as a whole has had a balance of these people. Now there there's an imbalance. Now the people who want to give humans the upper hand have taken the upper hand in humanity. They've won the war of humanity, and so now. For the sake of humanity, like people will, like, this might sound like a stupid example, but it's not trivial. It's not trivial. The fact that like Harambe happened, I, I shouldn't even have said that. Never mind. Ignore what I said. But if that kind of thing were to happen again and it was one dude being attacked by like a thousand gorillas, you know what we'd do, right? We'd send a billion dollars worth of resources to attack every single one of those gorillas, have a whole militia out there, bring in helicopters, don't even care if it's at like the fucking North Pole. We'd fucking find a way just to save that one person because we're so averse to nature getting even a tiny hit on us that we have to go, no, we're gonna kill nature. But people still want that in their lives because the meaning in life does not come from absolutely crushing nature it comes from a fair fight it comes from knowing that they could beat us but we're holding our own as a species we're holding our own and sometimes we lose sometimes we'll win the round sometimes but the rounds keep going and so long as we're both you know okay and we're standing the rounds can just keep going and going and going and going forever because if there's no one in there to fight us and the other the opponent is literally just dead you know what happens right like we die, if you'd remove all the biodiversity from nature, there's no energy left in the system and we die. If we over, over hunt an uh, animal in an in a area, a tribe over hunts an animal, and all those animals go extinct, those people starve. 
So literally, it's a selfish reason. It's a literal selfish reason to preserve the biodiversity of life and of, of protect the earth, to save the earth. It's literally a selfish reason. It's for ourselves. And that's literally the only reason why we feel that way. People think they're so morally self-righteous when they want to protect the earth. They're not. They want to do it because human beings want to do it. They don't want to protect the, they don't want to protect the bugs. You ask these people. Uh, don't ask giants. They're different. They're built different. But, man, I remember I, I, would, I was in India a few months ago. And uh, the giants would walk on the street with no, with no sandals or no shoes. They would walk barefoot. Because they're like, I, I, if I uh, step on a bug, I won't be able to feel it. So I can take my foot off immediately um, and I don't kill the bug accidentally. Because if you step on the floor with sandals, you can't feel the bugs underneath. So you might accidentally kill the bugs and take lives from the world. So they're, they're built different. But you ask a normal Western person who has these ideas. They're like, oh, save the pandas, bro. Save the pandas. Bro, what about all the bugs? They're just as alive. That's the thing. Morality is aesthetic. We want to save the pandas because they look like humans. Because they're cute. That's literally why. Because things that look like humans are closer to us in the gene pool. And we want things that are as close to us as possible in the gene pool to survive. That's why we value our kids and our parents and our family more than other human beings. But we still do value other human beings. And you, and you look at it like from a, from a scientific perspective, there's controversy involved. But people who have similar genetics to you, even if they just met you and they never knew you their entire lives, they just meet you, they will be more likely to get along with you and to want you to succeed and to push you to go forward in life than they will for other people if they have similar genetics to you and you to them as well. <coughs> There's like a million different studies showing that. But um, what was I saying? God damn it. I was saying something. Hold up. Let me go back and listen to what I was saying. One sec. Right, yeah. So we want to preserve the biodiversity of life. Um <coughs> And the reason is selfish. The reason is because if there's biodiversity on Earth and in around and around us in our environment, then we as human beings also thrive. So we really only do things for ourselves. Um, and the reason why everyone is so like, man, that's so good that you think that uh, that you think that the reason why it's morally virtuous, considered morally virtuous by the culture to care about the environment is simply because there's an imbalance in the people who are in control not caring about the environment so the culture kind of has to pick up the slack and go like oh yeah no this is <clears throat> what we're going to consider morally virtuous and what you're doing is not morally virtuous and so that way we can shift the world a bit more in this way but really it's a it's a losing battle uh, as people have said, the left has already the left won the culture war. Now they're just going around shooting the survivors. And so, we find meaning in life from the battle, from a fair fight. I mean, that's why we put fake plastic plants in our home because we want to feel like we're still in nature, and that nature still might have some control over our lives, but we get to fight for control. But really, we don't. Really, it's just a plastic plant. It's literally the opposite of nature. Um, but people still want these things in their lives. They still. They're still manipulated by, oh, I want a red iPhone because it looks like red fruits and red fruits typically are not poisonous if they have sugar in them and things like, like, you know, um, red things tend to be nutritious in nature, but things like that. We, we, we like wearing fuzzy clothing because it feels like hugging someone with a lot of hair on them. Things like that, you know, we like feeling the warmth of, like, it's. There's a there's all these elements to our lives that all can be traced back to living in nature. And my perspective on this, my take on this, on what people should do doesn't really matter. I don't like it's not my call. It's not my decision to make on how people should live their lives on on how much of a fair fight it is. But <clears throat> the situation that it's evolved to right now is is we're in a boxing fight with nature but nature is dead. We've killed nature. God is dead and we have killed him. Nietzsche's quote. And we're going, we're, we're, what we've done is we've become so powerful that we've grown more hands 
and we've developed puppeteering tools to then puppeteer nature. This dead corpse in front of us is being puppeteered by our other hands, yet we're so stupid that we can't even realize that we're the ones doing this. And we know we are if we really think about it. We're, we're the ones puppeteering nature. We're the ones deciding, oh yeah, let's bring back woolly mammoths. Oh yeah, let's uh, uh, introduce a few wolves into this area so that we can make sure this invasive species doesn't take over and that we preserve the biodiversity. We're literally controlling nature just so it appeals to our whims, just so it can keep hitting us a little more. But really it's us puppeteering this dead corpse to hit us because that's where we get the meaning in life. And then we keep hitting it back and we're just crushing it. And because we're such a giant species and we're not very connected as individuals and we're not, there's no intimacy in the species anymore. We're not able to communicate with different parts of our, of our global consciousness. And so while one part of our consciousness goes like, let's bring some meaning back into our lives and experience something natural for once and let's have nature hit us again so that we experience some, a little bit of pain and that we experience a little bit of a lack of control over our lives so that we can fight for some control so we can find that meaning. Another part of us, another part of human beings, another part of collective consciousness, another group of human beings will go like, oh my God, we just got hurt by nature again. Kill it again, it's still alive, kill it, destroy it. And then they go out and they overfish and they kill hundreds of millions of sharks and they, they take the populations of coral reefs to the brink of extinction and they do all this stuff because they're like, oh no, we can't have even a single person dying. Oh no, coronavirus is taking people's lives. A totally natural thing. That's a natural way to die. And it's just a part of life. And dying is a part of life. Oh no, we can't have that because that's natural. And it's it's painful. Oh no, get rid of it. So yeah, dude, it's... it's it, say what you want about... about whether or not we should be more protective of human life or more protective of nature. But it's not my call to make, but I'm going to just tell you this. Nietzsche was right. God is dead and we have killed him. And he's been long dead since before I was born, yet still I'm an accomplice to this great murder. But yeah, that's really all I wanted to say Slight of hand magicians about are this. Like this is what you got to think about God as. Insanely talented. If, if you ask me, you can replace the word God with nature. But then when you start doing that for a couple of years, you'd be like, yeah, nature, this nature, that. But then it starts being kind of weird and you start to use the word God because nature is not enough. Nature implies there's certain signifiers with nature. When you say the word nature, people think of certain things. God implies more. God not only implies nature, it implies everything that is natural and everything that is not natural as well. It implies everything. It implies human beings, human life. Human beings are made are made in the image of God, right? And so if human beings wrote it, that means God also wrote it. So so God is meant to describe this basically a storytelling concept. God is a storytelling concept in the arc of life that is used to describe this thing that really can't be explained by any other word. You just kind of know it when you see it. Um and so that's really what God is in my mind and uh um that's what I have to say about this video. That's why I think a lot of atheists are fucking stupid. Because even though I don't necessarily believe in a divine God that created the universe or whatever that's watching, I don't believe in a heaven or hell, I don't believe in a soul, I don't believe in any sh that shit. I talk like, hey, bro, you doing this shit, bro? You, if you play Genshin Impact, your parents are going to hell. Or I say things like, uh, uh, you gotta you gotta write with, with your soul. You know, you gotta sing with your soul. Like, I say these things because it has meaning and it and it changes the way people behave and it, it's it's not trivial. These stories don't come from nothing. 